James, I don't see people coming in. Can you please open it so people can? Oh, hold on. Okay. James? Okay. Trying to figure out. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, we're waiting just a couple of minutes to have people come in. Um, wait for about 30 more seconds. It may be a little slow. And we will be right with you. And we welcome everyone. I also wanted to mention um, that uh, whoever is joining us to listen in, please introduce yourself in the chat uh, to tell us who you are, where you're from, and what country you might be uh, zooming in from. So I will go ahead and start. And I, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jocelyn Brown Hall. I am the director of the Liaison Office to North America of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or FAO. And uh, we are welcoming you to this high-level speaking series called Policy and Services to Support Landscape and Seascape Partnerships. How can we meet the sustainable development goals through integrated territorial action? And our, our event today is co-hosted um, with um, Echo Agriculture Partners. And this is uh, our 12th year of partnering with Echo Agriculture Partners and my colleague, Dr. Sarah Schur. Uh, we've been par partnering together since 2009 for the Landscape Roundtable Series. And we've been focusing on various aspects of, of links between climate change, agriculture, and landscapes and all the players in between. We're also trying to focus on how to support actors who are trying to integrate these three areas, which sometimes sadly are siloed and not moving us forward. Those of you on the call may be well aware that the UN Food System Summit and Climate Pre-COP26 uh, have iterated food and agriculture are central to many of the issues that we face today. And even though we're facing these issues and they're urgent and they seem like just overwhelming problems, we have real opportunities in this space to restore our ecosystems, mitigate climate change and disasters, and improve livelihoods by implementing solutions that are address the very problems um, that are part of a bigger picture. Working at the landscape level uh, with all of the different players uh, allows for consideration of environmental, social and economic objectives, and they inv involve diverse stakeholders to tackle the underlying causes of climate change and degrading landscapes. But for landscape partnerships to work most efficiently, they require stronger institutional support. And we'll hear of that today from our uh, illustrious speakers. Today's event coincides not only with the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, but also with Land and Water Day, which aims to increase the awareness about sustainable management of resources to include, to improve local livelihoods in the land and water space. We are also launching the 2021 State of the World's Land and Water Resources for the Food and Agriculture SOLA 2021. Um, which highlights the worsening state of the world of the earth's soil, land, and water resources, and the challenges that poses for feeding a global population that will exceed 10 billion people after 2050. So with that as a backdrop, uh, both some enormous and looming problems, but also some wonderful opportunities, I look forward to hearing from our panel today of experts on policies and services that enable landscape and seascape partnerships. To get us started today, there's a couple of housekeeping rules that I'd like to go over. First of all, this event is being recorded and live streamed on our Twitter at FAO North America, the Twitter page. I will briefly introduce each speaker, but you can find the full biographies in the chat box. We encourage our participants and our audience to use the chat box to tell us who you are and where you're joining from. And also use the Q&A box for any questions that you might have. And our speakers um, will try to answer them one by one. And then will there also be an opportunity for me to pose some of those questions towards the end. 
And as a brief outline, we have four speakers and we'll start off with an introduction to a framework for policy and program support. Then we'll hear about this experience um, in the country of Benin uh, for integrating policy for landscape development, followed by a brief Q&A. Then we'll hear about achievements and priorities for policies to support landscapes in the United States and comments about the 20 by 20 initiative followed by another Q&A opportunity. And then we'll also hear from World Resources Institute. And we'll welcome comments from participants who have a discussion amongst panelists followed by some key takeaway messages. So um, I have a hard stop at 11.30 to do another appointment. So I will get all of this in a jam-packed 90 minutes and we'll start off with our partner, uh, my co-conspirator in this space, uh, Dr. Sarah Schur, who is an agricultural natural resource economist specializing in land management. She founded and has led the international nonprofit Eco Agriculture Partners in 2002, and FAO has partnered with her since 2009. Sarah, the floor is over to you. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here with everyone, and we love these, uh, these quarterly dialogues that we do with folks and really encourage all the folks involved to, uh, who are here to very actively use the chat and the Q&A. Um, James, if you could go ahead and pass me my PowerPoint, I will uh, start, the, start the talk. And let me see uh, where we're going. Okay, uh, this is great. Um, as, as, as almost all of you all know, um, in the last few decades, there's been enormous growth in landscape partnerships around the world, mainly catalyzed by local stakeholders who groups who are seeking to regenerate their own economies and communities and ecosystems. Um, but more recently, there has been a huge interest from international and national policymakers who uh, see the ILM, integrated landscape management, as a potential solution to achieve the sustainable development goals and climate action in more holistic and cost effective ways. But there's actually been very little coherent policy at the national level to support landscape partnerships, um, although local governments are, are involved in almost all of these initiatives. Um, the purpose of my talk today is to share some of the learnings that have come out of a project that Eco Agriculture Partners has been doing over the last year uh, with a Gallup, with Columbia University and Cornell University to evaluate the experience that we do have on policy design that strengthens landscape partnerships. The, uh, let's see, moving next, there we go. Um, so, so historically, over, at least over the last 150 years, national and state land and rural development policy all around the world has been highly siloed by sector. Most of you know this, focused on what's supposedly the best use of the land for a particular purpose. So ministries of agriculture support farmers and agribusiness to do production. Um, ministries of Environment um, support protected areas and, and water sources. Whoops, don't want, not ready to go back there yet. Not sure why it's gone. Um, anyway, we can keep it there. Hmm. Um, but these institutional structures are still dominant today. Um, how do I, James, I don't know how to do that. Let's see why it moved. Um, anyway, these institutional structures are still dominant today. So even policymakers who are committed to support sustainable development struggles struggle to devise policies and programs that effectively impact local realities. We're seeing impressive growth in the national and international financial flows to address climate change, biodiversity, food systems, forest protection, but with mainly sectoral policy tools at their disposal, resources are flowing top down in ways that conflict, undermine one another, or fail to reach the millions of local land managers who are the key landscape stewards. So today, land uses in most landscapes are intimately interconnected with other resource users in the mosaic. Uh, to provide food security and livelihoods and to address environmental threats like climate change, water scarcity, and deforestation, we need landscape development that aligns public policies and programs for agriculture, forestry, watershed, biodiversity, business development, human settlements, and, 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 and build infrastructure. It needs to support collaborative action. Okay, so um, what we did in um, our program is ask the research question, 
uh, what kinds of national policies and programs can most effectively support landscape partnerships to deliver benefits? And to do this, we um, interviewed in depth a, a group of 14 experts with deep develop landscape development and policy experience, uh, also drew on literature and on a series of online and in-person dialogues with landscape leaders. So um, this is just a list of the uh, 14 experts that we consulted from a very diverse group of uh, organizations about a very diverse group of, of, uh, of case studies. And this map just shows where those, uh, those case studies were very diverse indigenous organizations, uh, in initiatives, uh, territorial development, um, watershed management, et cetera. But I wanna move now to our findings. Um, the, the, and this is really focused on two key things. Um, the first one is, what are the actual kinds of support that are needed by landscape partnerships? Um, the group strongly agreed, our group of experts um, strongly agreed that many, if not most, of all the key functions for effective landscape partnership development and implementation can actually be found within the landscape, within the landscape partnership. And if they're not there, they can recruit new local partners who can provide those functions and that expertise. But there are four types of support that are very difficult for local partnerships to provide themselves. Um, the first one is the legal framework within which they operate and coordination of policy support across ministries and authorities. It makes it very difficult for them to operate if these things are, are not in place. And they need to be recognized as operational mechanisms with whom government entities would, would interact. Um, secondly, is technical services. Um, the work of integrated landscape management is, is very challenging and very wide ranging. Um, so there's a need for training services for landscape facilitators and technical and advisory services so that experts can come and give advice uh, and input and connections um, that will support regenerative projects and businesses. And they also need access to the right kinds of data and scientific support. The third area where they really do need some external support uh, has to do with finance. Um, as most of you know, one of the key functions of landscape partnerships is to develop not only a vision and action plans, but to translate those action plans into investable landscape investment portfolios. Um, what kind of projects, nonprofit projects, businesses, and other kinds of, of investments are needed. And the, getting the financing for those is very challenging. Um, they need help with getting sources of financing, market connections, um, and, and also for co-financing the activities of the landscape partnerships for coordination, et cetera, uh, over time, and, and looking at the financial architecture. And finally, they need effective low-cost networks to connect them with market buyers, government offices, allies for political advocacy work, and, and other activities that will support their work. So those are the four areas that we need to concentrate on for policy support. The, um, the next set of, um, of, of findings that we have, and I'm trying to figure out how to move this forward, there we go, uh, is that it's just not enough to say, oh, we're going to put these institutions in place. Sorry about that, you guys. This system uh, seems to have a slow response time for my uh, moving it forward. Um, okay, hold on. There we go. We'll I take your we'll time, Sarah, there. and I think also hopefully it's, it will it's stay it's there. Cold. Okay, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but, but it's not enough to simply have these institutional support in place. There's certain we found seven key ingredients that actually made them work, um, and so I wanted to briefly share those with you. Um, the first one is the the institutions need to have a, an alignment with the concept of participatory landscape governance, that they are external programs in service to the communities in the landscape. An example of this is in the Australian land care movement, which is government supported, but grounded in relationships. And it's set up to respond to local defined priorities. And this model is being taken up in like 25 countries now. 
A second key ingredient is coordination among service providers. Um, there is no one institutional model. The group does not think there is one institutional model. It needs to be adapted to the context, but there needs to be a bit of a division of labor and a clear understanding and relationship between different service providers. For example, in India, there's been a sort of an agreement that the National Biodiversity Authority will manage national level coordination, uh, that the states will provide defined services, and that local governments will support and authorities will uh, and bodies that have multi-stakeholder groups in them will support specific landscapes. Um, the third key ingredient is uh, long-term support services, i.e. it needs to be institutionalized. Having services provided by NGOs occasionally and by special short-term projects does not work. Um, and a really good example of where this has been done well is the support that was given by the government of Germany over a 40-year period to the watershed program of Ethiopia which has really helped them to adapt over time, to develop, to institutionalize their activities. And it's really a model uh, of success uh, globally. The fourth ingredient is effective engagement with the private sector and financial institutions. Um, businesses are key actors in landscape partnerships. They can reduce business risks, provide opportunities and generate the economic development in a sustainable way if they're done right. Um, but uh, an example of this is in Scotland where public private cooperation uh, allowed private companies that were facing business threats from resource degradation to band together to collaboratively fund a mechanism that would pay local farmers and reward local farmers and land stewards to restore those resources. It was a really exciting kind of a, a collaborative model. A, a fifth one is long-term financing for both the landscape enabling investments, which is the things you put in place to make it possible for people to work together, to do the training, to do the assessment, to do the collaboration and the asset investments, the things that actually change the, the realities on the ground. Um, and this involves three different elements. One is grant funding sources for landscape partnerships to do their coordination work. The second one is the coordination of public financing flows. And the third one is the establishment of financial mechanisms that will allow private, public, and civic sources of funding to, uh, to blend together uh, to, to, to um, fund the investments that are required. The sixth um, uh, ingredient is public policy frameworks for multi-stakeholder landscape action. Obviously, devolution and decentralization help in this process, but there's also processes of dialogue among cabinet members of policy, et cetera. Um, for example, in Namibia, established a cross-ministry policy coordination platform to support community conservancies. And finally, there's a need to support partnerships own networks. These are arising all around the world. We've just done a review uh, with 1,000 landscapes and find that let's support their networks, not just try to create new ones. Um, so as a result of this, we're actually quite optimistic that we're in a position right now, uh, to, we're inspired that countries can indeed put effective policies and programs in place to support landscape partnerships. And we've come up with a bit of a sort of how do you get started on this process uh, by setting up a multi-sector task force, uh, it directly engaging with the existing landscape and seascape partnerships to do this, systematically assess government policies and decision structures, to identify where the constraints and opportunities are in the current system, evaluate who's actually providing services already and including the NGOs as well as the uh, government actors and private sector actors, and, and then proposing models and having a platform for all the different stakeholders nationally to discuss what kind of strategy would, would move forward for, for this. And we think this is particularly critical uh, at this moment in time uh, and that there's catalysts to, to push this, this uh, policy work forward as countries need to develop their strategies to meet international commitments under the Convention on Biological Diversity, Land Degradation and Climate Change. Um, also new funding that's coming in for, uh, for, for, for landscape regeneration like AFR 100, 20 by 20, you'll hear about in a minute, 30 by 30 and national all of government recovery programs that are putting billions of dollars into the European Union Green Deal and the US Build Back Better, 
national food systems transformation efforts and, and, and resource mobilization for global climate and environment funds. If we just have these flows of funds coming in through sectoral mechanisms to specific actors on the ground, we're not gonna get the results we need. So this is the moment uh, that, to really strengthen landscape partnerships to absorb and well utilize this work. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Sarah. My mouse is also cold too, and I couldn't unclick. Um, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate that. And I, I loved your slide um, that you talked to, you know, you could see from the picture, the different ministries, um, and maybe uh, when we get our technology um, back up and running, you can put that up um, at, towards the end so we can have a conversation about that. And that flows extremely well um, into our next guest, uh, Dr. Luke Nyakaja. I've been practicing his name all day, so hopefully I got it correctly. Um, and I am so delighted that he's with us because uh, Luke has been the architect in the concept of land degradation neutrality uh, in Benin and served from 1999 to 2005 as Minister of Environment and Urban Development. So he really has on the ground experience in this area. And he is also the founder and president of GPS Dev, Governance and Policies for De Sustainable Development, which is a think tank where the mission is to make governance systems more conducive to sustainable um, development, especially in Africa. Uh, Monsieur Gnaja, la parole est à vous. Merci, Jocelyn. Thank you, dear Jocelyn. Uh, I'm very pleased to join, and the purpose of my contribution will be to introduce our viewers to how we have uh, ignited and catalyzed policy change in Benin. I will take you to uh, four sections of, of my uh, contribution. First, making the case beyond the ministries of agriculture and environment, and second, uh, national dialogue to catalyze policy change. And my third point will be what impact so far on the ground and what challenges will be the last one. Agriculture is the basis of the economy of Benin. It generates 32% uh, of the GDP, 75% of export earnings for the country, and it provides 50% uh, of the employment. So it's quite, is, is actually the, the, the largest uh, economic sector in the country. The impact of climate change on agriculture are one of the main threats to the growth potential and production of the Beninese economy. That is why public policies should really integrate at national and subnational level uh, in a transversal manner uh, how we will maintain, enhance the natural resource that is land. But we were not there till 2018, uh, in spite of uh, the, the fact that Benin has adopted the SDGs and, and come up with the core target for the country. In Benin, agriculture is extensive, made up of small uh, family farms with little uh, mechanization, low productivity. Agriculture in Benin depends essentially on rainfall for water supply. That is why it's very vulnerable to climate change. Now, let's look at the, how the impact of land degradation uh, affect development in Benin. In, when you discuss with uh, the converted one, the, the people who are involved in agriculture sometimes, but environment mainly, they know all the, the numbers I will share with you, but it, it remains in that circle. So making the case of socioeconomic impacts of land degradation beyond the ministries of agriculture and environment has really the key for igniting the required policy change process. So uh, let me give a few numbers about the impact of land degradation in Benin. 32% of the population uh, in Benin uh, in rural areas uh, is affected by land degradation processes and this number has increased in one, uh, from 2000 to 2010 by 37%, which means that not only the processes are there, but they are escalating, they're accelerating. And by um, 2000 uh, economic terms, 
the socioeconomic impact of loan degradation has been estimated to up to 8% of the nation GDP per year and some 220,000 hectares of productive land being lost every year. So it's, it's something that is very huge. But uh, more precisely, uh, for some crops, uh, there is a sharp decline in agricultural productivity, sometimes up to 40% in one decade. Rapid expansion of agricultural land, about 5% every year. That is double of the natural uh, population increase. So you can understand why the, it is a double is because productivity dropping, people are compensating by increasing the expansion of their uh, farmland. And in 2000 and 2010, during that decade, agriculture has contributed to the loss of forest and natural ecosystem by 98%. And of course, systemic poverty and food insecurity in the affected areas, vulnerability to climate change and on. So those data has been there. Uh, they have been even updated in 2017 in the context of the country's uh, uh, work at the uh, technical level in designing the land degradation neutrality target for the country. But it has take, stayed there. So the, the question is how do we take it beyond uh, those who are already aware, who are working on the issue, mainly in the Department of uh, uh, Environment and some people in the Department of Agriculture. This is where it has been key to have some bilateral with decision makers, taking the numbers, for instance, meeting the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of Environment and letting them know personally, not their staff, but personally, those numbers, they were uh, like, <laughs> where have you found them? You see, the numbers are on your shelves, but you just don't read them because you don't have time for it. So let us look at it and see how we move from here. And then taking the, those numbers, to the ministers of uh, uh, decentralization, the ministers of uh, uh, development planning and the minister of finance has then had to have a, a kind of um, government level uh, change actors who decided to say, okay, now let us make the best out of it because the best is that the cost of action through sustainable landscape management at subnational level is just a small percentage of what it costs the a country uh, to let go uh, uh, degradation. So bringing all those numbers has helped to establish at the national level a multi-tax, a multi-sector tax force. And within that, that tax force, ministries were represented key groups of stakeholders, including farmers, herders were represented to discuss, to get acquainted to the numbers, to the causes of degradation, to the, to the options for action. And their work has laid the ground for uh, a national dialogue that has taken place uh, in February, 2018. And that dialogue has been a kind of uh, a big high level um, dialogue for two days uh, involving government uh, members, especially ministries of ministers of uh, development planning, uh, finance, agriculture, environment, and decentralization to discuss how we move forward and with what. The, the purpose of the dialogue, dialogue was to mainstream sustainable landscape management paradigm into land, land use change in Benin, what it implies at institutional level, what it implies at public investment level, and how it will impulse uh, you know, the implementation of the SDGs in Benin. Those elements has really been the focus. Now, the whole dialogue has had a breakout session. The breakout session has uh, focused on one, uh, one breakout session has focused on identifying the constraint and propose solution for an effective integration of SLM policies into national planning and investment strategies. The second one has worked on how to ensure the effective involvement of the private sector in sustainable landscape management initiative 
and related in value chains, how will they get involved into it for what benefit for them? Because of course, private sector is mostly interested when it has a positive impact on their value chain. And the third point uh, in the breakout session has been to elaborate strategies, a concrete one for subnational governance level action. How do we make this work at subnational level? Those has been the three breakout session and the outcome has helped to come up with a national uh, 10 year strategy 2018, 2027. That has been adopted by the government with a, an investment framework for the 10 years. And it has been developed around four pillars. And we, we all know those four pillars. The first one is to integrate landscape approaches in agricultural development planning and investment framework, framework at all levels. The second is to eliminate perverse incentives that have been enhancing degradation processes. The third one is to devise positive incentives that will reward the adoption of SLM practices and uh, uh, incentivize uh, initiative in that regard. And the last one has been how do we monitor and ensure accountability? So the investment plan has been approved a few months later in 2018. And nowadays the government is preparing another meeting to monitor, to bring together what has been done uh, since the three years the, the plan has been adopted. So what has been done? What has been the impact so far? At national level, it has really helped to translate in the development plan for agriculture, uh, the principle or the concept of avoid, reduce and restore. It has also helped to uh, reflect that strategy into the NDC of the nation as, as well as the, the NAP, the National Adaptation Plan, uh, of the country. And something that has helped now is that the government has now undertaken a national census of farm, uh, farm by uh, or through the, our six agroecological zones. And this is with the purpose of providing very tailored assistance to farmers. So the census has been done and the work is underway now to design how they will provide tailored assistance to farmers. Uh, and another point has been a, a new financial mechanism for supporting sustainable investment in agriculture. This is, has started last year and is under development, is doing quite well so far. That is at national level. At local level, uh, local dialogue has been conducted in several uh, territories by local government uh, leaders that has in, uh, involved uh, stakeholders for design integrated territorial action uh, embedded now in the development plan at the territories level, mapping the status of uh, uh, land and the fertility at local level to understand where to start from, where there are priorities for investment and discussion on targets at subnational level has been underway as well, as well as uh, the, the way to integrate uh, SLM uh, into the new so-called generation of development plan at subnational level. That has been done. You can see that for some, it may not be exactly practical yet. And you right, it's not yet as practical as one will, will wish it to be regarding landscape partnership. But what are the challenges? The challenges are that first, stakeholders, those who are involved in uh, agricultural land use at subnational level, they have quite a blurred understanding of the concept of uh, landscape. Farmers do not really understand uh, uh, what landscape is, as well as even many of the policymakers at subnational level, they don't really understand the concept of landscape. That is a, a major problem that is calling for capacity building, and uh, as well as the lack of capacity in designing and supporting landscape action and the way to build partnership around it. When you don't exactly know what it means landscape, it is difficult for them to bring around the table those who are involved. So that is where the discussion at the subnational level has helped in uh, having a dialogue with, among those who have the same problem of degradation. 
That has been one of the approaches that has worked so far. And another point is the lack of financial resources to catalyze landscape partnership and related investment where they have been established. Some of them have been established, but uh, they have difficulty, difficulties in accessing the resources uh, in the framework that has been established. So that's where we stand after uh, two, two years plus in implementing the action plan. Over to you, Jocelyn. 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 Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I thank you so much. And let me start again. Um, I just want to comment on a couple of themes that uh, you and Sarah talked about a little bit to see if there are any other follow-up questions. Um, but this idea of um, you know getting the public and the private sectors together, Sarah, you touched on sort of NGOs, which is you know not not a um, not necessarily the traditional private sector, but it's certainly not the public sector. And um, you know, trying to make sure that these one-off projects, you know, while they may be helpful um, in one specific space and one specific time, it's not going to move the needle across the whole landscape. Um, and then, uh, Luke, you also talked about, um, you know, getting ministers of of these various ministers together um, and getting them to understand, you know, how they impact one another. Having worked in a government entity myself in the Department of Agriculture for over 20 years, um, I know how hard that is, uh, you know, to, to get the Secretary of Agriculture and the Secretary of Transportation and the Secretary of Commerce and uh, Secretary of State and others to, you know, sit down and talk about landscapes. That's, that's not an easy job. So if you multiply that by all the countries around. So I, uh, I wanted to see if there were any other further questions um, in the chat. I also, before I turn it over to any questions, or maybe I wanted to make sure that um, we acknowledge um, the different people that are on the chat. We've got someone from Timor-Leste, someone from Bangladesh, uh, I think someone from India. Um, and we also have a board member from Eco Agriculture uh, Partners, Kay Kwam, uh, seems to be on the line. So we're really excited that everyone has joined us. Um, is there anyone who would like to rate, uh, to ask a question in the Q and A at all? Um, I don't see any opened ones. Um, okay. Would you like uh, us to respond to your question? Yes, please. That would be great. <laughs> since, there's, since we don't have one on there right now, I, I was just going to say I think one of the things that we have come up with is you know, landscape regeneration for the economy and the society and for the ecology takes a generation or two generations. It's a long-term process. And the fact that so much of the funding available is in the form of short-term projects, whether it's government projects or NGO projects or, you know, other philanthropic projects. And in itself, it's not bad to have a short, you know, that's the way some institutions just are. That's the only way they can operate. But if there is a long-term landscape plan, and if there's a group within the landscape that's engaging with these different shorter term projects, they can be directed to the locally defined objectives. Um, so we need, we, need, uh, we need sources of financing for both the enabling investments and the asset investments, you know, where we, where we look at 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years for some of these to come to fruition. Um, but if you're gonna come in with short-term funding, make it fund the action plan that's been collaboratively developed within the landscape. I think that's one of the big lessons that we've learned. Maybe off to right. Luke for Luke, your comment. Do you have a comment on on how to you know make these because you know let's face it we're talking about long term things um, we're talking about you know soil health which is does not you were talking about deforestation those kinds of solutions pro, solutions to those kinds of problems are not short term solutions um, and so they're not even five year solutions they're ten year fifteen year twenty year solutions um, or beyond. So uh, any thoughts on your part, Luke, about how that has, you know, how you can, um, you can also uh, influence policymakers who oftentimes have a very short, uh, you know, they're looking at their next election or their what's happening, you know, their next win. So any thoughts since you've served in the government, any thoughts in that area? And you're also muted. 
You have my problem. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, indeed, indeed, it is challenging, especially in the context where everything is a priority and everything is important, everything is urgent. It is difficult to have a government really uh, uh, agreeing to take resources to invest into a program that will yield results in 10 or 15 years. It is very challenging. That is why it is important to lay uh, the, the framework of cost of uh, inaction that are sometimes very high, as you can see, and we have heard it from Benin, versus the, the very uh, percentage, little percentage of that cost that can be invested, though it will yield a result in 15 years or 10 years, it will still yield a result. And it is also important to look for, look for, and sometimes find low-hanging fruit. There are sometimes low-hanging fruit when you bring people to agree to first understand the processes of degradation in their landscape. And when they decide on not doing the things that are actually enhancing the degradation, sometimes it may yield some low-hanging fruit that may be uh, therefore interesting for uh, local policymakers. So, uh, for instance, bringing uh, herders and farmers to agree instead of, you know, uh, uh, conflicting to agree. That is something that is key, especially in these days where climate change is fueling uh, 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 the migration of, of herders. I'm going to just rest on one quick question here. Um, this is for you, Luke. Um, but it's uh, following up on this issue around uh, different players within the herder, within the landscape. Um, and it talks about how do you align the interests to reduce, how do you align interests to reduce conflict amongst small scale farmers and large scale agribusinesses? So I think this is, you know, there are many large scale agribusinesses out there that may not have the landscape um, not only may not have a landscape view, but may not view mm -hmm. the landscape as a resource to be protected. Um, so how do you do that? I know that I have some experience in this area um, in Ghana, but I would be interested to know your experience in Benin. Well, uh, this is where, uh, you know, public regulation can step in and bring the solution. When public regulation, for instance, regarding land use, or regarding uh, the how uh, a, a monocropping uh, uh, is impacting, for instance, we have had that in Benin regarding cotton. We are the first cotton producer now uh, since two years now in Africa, and this is ha having huge impact on uh, regarding degradation, not only on the land but also on on water. And even <laughs> on top of that, it is. Uh, um, increasing the vulnerability of cities that are downstream to those landscape where monocropping of cotton is, is underway. So, and you can see that when, when the cost of infrastructure in those cities are higher than what the city can afford, then uh, uh, regulation can be taken a bit more easily by uh, uh, policy makers deciding on how the land should use what should step in, and this may sometimes help to bring uh, landscape players, stakeholders to agree. But it, it takes first the right understanding of the causes of degradation versus the benefits. Very often, when you put the causes of degradation and the benefit of restoration, or at least of avoiding degradation on the table, it actually minimizes the, 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 the conflict, or at least it brings them to understand that we may be yielding some short-term result nowadays, but we may be out of business uh, in 10 years. I completely agree. And I think it, um, there's a, quite a few questions in here about you know, how do you bring these players together? And I personally, in my 20 plus years of working in this, in agriculture and in food security spaces, I haven't found a 
different or more powerful mechanism than just doing community by community community but it's very labor intensive to bring the communities together to bring the players together and say okay these are the challenges but and yet um, if anyone else has any better ideas of how to do it but i think it really does have to be um, you know you have to bring the stakeholders together and, and have them talk about it so I'm going to move on, um, and I think we're having a nice uh, lead into our next speaker, um, who is Ernest Cook, the director of the Network for Landscape Conservation. Ernest previously worked for the Trust for Public Land from 1980 to 2018. He served in various positions there, from top budget manager to head of institutional philanthropy, senior real estate negotiator. Um, and he is particularly recognized for founding a conservation finance program that has played a leading role in generating over $90 billion in new state and local government funds for parks and lands conservation. So um, maybe, Luke, you've got the, um, I mean, uh, Ernest, you've got the um, silver bullet that we need, the, the magic potion that we need to how do we do long term uh, financing in this space. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Ernest. Well, I wish I had that silver bullet, but uh, even 90 billion, as helpful as it is, is not uh, completing the job. There's a, a lot more work that has to be done. So um, my experience and the work of the Network for Landscape Conservation is focused on the United States, although we increasingly engage with uh, partners north and south of the border. But my discussion today or my remarks today are going to be really focused on the United States. Um, I'd say that there are three pillars of federal legislation and policy that really are the foundation for um, landscape conservation in America. One is the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, which was founded in 1933 as the Soil Conservation Service to deal with extensive soil erosion and degradation. Number two, I'd say, is the Endangered Species Act of 1973, which was enacted to protect native plants and animals. And third, the Clean Water Act of 1977, um, which was uh, enacted to control discharge of pollutants. Originally, this was focused uh, on point sources of pollution, like factories that are, were emitting toxic chemicals. But now that the worst of the point source pollution uh, has largely been uh, mitigated uh, in the United States. The focus has turned to non-point source pollution as the primary source of uh, 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 pollution and degradation of our waterways. And dealing with non-point um, pollution requires a watershed land use approach. So together, these three initiatives address our most important natural resources, our soils, our native plants and animals, and our waters. And all three of them are best carried out through landscape conservation. In the US, private property rights are protected by the Constitution. You can't eliminate a landowner's right to develop property through regulation. You have to pay the landowner to give up that right. But it's not feasible for governments or nonprofit conservancies to buy all the land that should be protected especially if the land is being used for farming, grazing, or private forestry. That land should by and large remain used for those purposes in private ownership. So the solution is conservation easements. They're a kind of halfway measure. Conservation easements compensate the landowner for giving up development rights, but the land remains in private hands. Now in the United States, the use of land is governed by state and local laws, not the federal government. So all 50 states had to adopt legislation that allowed for conservation easements. This took place maybe in the 1970s and 1980s. So that uh, state participation in helping to create a framework for landscape conservation was absolutely essential. And uh, conservation easements are one of the principal tools being used by landscape conservation partnerships. Every few years, the Network for Landscape Conservation conducts a survey of landscape conservation partnerships in the United States. We can say that landscape conservation is characterized by multiple partners in a voluntary association, 
Their work crosses boundaries of counties, states, and even international borders. And they're typically um, pursuing multiple purposes, may include uh, protecting habitat for flora and fauna, protecting working lands, public recreation, protecting cultural resources, advancing public health, and safeguarding traditional ways of life. Many types of, uh, of conservation are typically taking place. Uh, that can be purchase of land, uh, acquisition of conservation easements, or simply landowner agreements to manage lands in a particular way for some period of time. So landscape conservation is a complex undertaking and managing that complexity is a challenge. To do a good job almost always requires a staff person, um, a coordinator. Uh, I think uh, Sarah may have used the term a facilitator. To do things as simple as arranging a meeting time for the, the collaboration, or as difficult as creating an action plan that reflects the contributions and commitments of all the partners. The coordinator is really the glue that holds a landscape partnership together. One of our programs at the Network for Landscape Conservation is a small grant program that supports landscape conservation partnerships. The grants can technically be used for any purpose, but 99% of the time, the proposals we receive request funding for that vital coordinator role. In the United States, there are some good federal government programs that provide this kind of support. One of my, one of my favorites is called the Sentinel Landscapes Program. Um, this program fosters collaboration to protect land around military installations. Uh, a core purpose of the program is to prevent encroachment of development that would interfere with military testing and training. But the Sentinel Landscape Program recognizes that land around military installations has a wide range of values for farming, forestry, and grazing, for wildlife habitat, and for watershed protection. So the program builds partnerships and supports conservation for all these purposes. The program is overseen by a federal coordinating committee that includes the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Interior Fish and Wildlife Service. All three agencies contribute to core funding that pays for a coordinator uh, and for creating conservation plans. And these plans are followed up with a significant funding for implementing plans, conservation on the ground. So again, this, uh, I think uh, you'll see a lot in common with what Sarah was talking about with uh, conservation collaboratives, that there's both long-term funding for the kind of backbone work of, uh, of functioning of the collaboration, as well as some short-term funding for implementing particular projects. Sentinel landscapes are not all about federal agencies. Every uh, Sentinel landscape is a broad partnership with state and local governments, nonprofit conservancies, and groups representing landowners uh, like the Farm Bureau. Now, the engine behind landscape partnerships is often money. Um, and the best opportunity for creating that money uh, and for um, uh, enlarging the pie for making more government funding often comes when government agencies create incentives that leverage each other. Um, a really good example of this uh, is how state governments uh, have created incentives for local governments is the state of New Jersey's local open space trust fund program. Um, in New Jersey, if a local government completes an open space conservation plan and adopts the modest increase in the local property tax, it's guaranteed to get matching funds from the state. This incentive is so attractive that all 21 counties and a majority of municipalities have enrolled. This funding framework powers landscape collaboratives throughout the state. One example is the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. The coalition has over 100 members, uh, including eight local beer breweries, because the highlands are the water source for over 300 municipalities in the state. The highlands include portions of seven counties, all of which are protecting the landscape using local open space trust funds 
uh, and matching state dollars. Looking to the future, I think one area that needs serious work in this country is to create policies and services that support landscape uh, conservation related to mitigation of damage from flooding. The States and much of the world is threatened by coastal flooding because of climate change, which is causing sea levels to rise and increasing the frequency and intensity of coastal storms. Inland areas are also getting flooded by rivers that overflow their banks due to storms that are dumping record amounts of rain. We need a policy to recognize that large scale land conservation and restoration of wetlands and watersheds are essential to mitigate flood risk. This is going to include buyouts of properties that have already been developed, but lie in harm's way. We need strategies like the Netherlands has adopted in its Room for the River program that reconnects rivers with their floodplains and allows them to overflow and occupy those floodplains when there are major storm events. We also need to have a deliberate strategy for managed retreat from the seacoast. The responsibility for mitigating flood hazard in this country falls largely to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, known as FEMA, and its counterpart agencies in the states and territories. There is almost no engagement between these agencies and landscape conservation partnerships. With few exceptions, land conservation agencies and nonprofit organizations do not participate in planning or implementing hazard mitigation projects. Back to you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Ernest. Um, I really appreciate your last point. I have a, a fair amount of experience in the international emergency space or, um, and I would say not only does FEMA have little engagement on the landscape process in the United States, but I would, I would argue that uh, in the emergency space, in the international emergency space, uh, people are not thinking about um, the landscapes of uh, the, 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 the recipients of their aid. So I think that's a global issue as well. Um, yeah. Perhaps the agencies are, as in the United States, typically kind of responding to emergencies that have happened rather than doing the kind of long-term planning and commitment that we all know is essential for landscape conservation action. Yes, agreed. Um, we're going to turn now to Maggie Gonzalez, who uh, is a research analyst for the Global Restoration Initiative of the Food, Forest, and Water Program of the World Resources Institute. Um, Maggie works directly for the Initiative 20 by 20, a country-led effort aiming to bring 20 million hectares of degraded land in Latin America and, Car and the Caribbean into restoration by 2020. Um, she's also worked on WRI's water team where she conducted research of nature-based solutions in Latin America and the Caribbean. So she has a wide range of experience working on projects with a particular focus on sustainable agriculture, integrated water resources management and nature-based solutions. And uh, Maggie, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, that project, the 20 by 20 project and how it um, maybe could be replicated um, worldwide. Over to you, Maggie. Great, thank you so much, Jocelyn. And thank you again, both Sarah and Jocelyn for um, inviting me to join the panel today. So I'm sitting in for my colleague, Renee Samora. Um, I'm relatively newer to the team, so I'll, I'll do my best here, but happy to join and, uh, and share a little bit about our work in Latin America um, and specifically on our restoration policy accelerator, which is uh, most directly linked to the discussion today. Um, so the initiative 20 by 20 is, as Jocelyn mentioned, a country-led effort that's seeking to change the dynamics of land degradation in Latin America and the Caribbean. The initiative was launched at the COP in 2014, as a, and as a result, um, 18 Latin American and Caribbean countries, as well as three regional programs in Brazil, have committed to restoring. It's now They've, they've increased it, so um, it's 52 million hectares of land by 2030. 
um, and the commitments contribute directly to the bond challenge and to the New York Declaration on Forest Global Commitment, which is to restore 350 million hectares of the world's degraded forests by 2030, so during the same period. Um, and now, you know, restoration can mean a, a wide range of things. And so I think it's worth mentioning that in the context of the work that we do through the initiative 20 by 20, restoration isn't limited to forest and to ecological restoration, but it consists of um, a complex mosaic landscape perspective. And so it includes multiple ecosystems and land uses. And more specifically, you know, in forests, we support reforestation, whether it's natural or assisted, and efforts to avoid degradation and to help bring ecological functionality to entire landscapes. But also in agricultural areas, we work to boost crop yields while protecting water sources, soil health, um, and supporting different types of sustainable agriculture initiatives, such as agroforestry, silvopasture, and uh, low carbon farming techniques. Um, and this is really critical to the work that we do, given that you know, we have a deep appreciation for the need to scale ecological restoration, but at the same time, we work closely on social and economic issues at the World Resources Institute, and we're you know, acutely aware of the region's economic needs and the fact that millions of livelihoods depend upon productive land uses. Um, so therefore, we're, we're quite intentional in our efforts to include productive restoration efforts uh, in the work that we do. And so we, we advance kind of our restoration objectives through three main avenues. And so the first as a research institution is you know, the research and analytics side of the work that we do um, with a strong focus on economics and finance of restoration as well as policy. The second component is through technical support. Um, and so here we, we look to find ways for all of that research that we're developing to really be useful to those that are implementing restoration strategies on the ground in these different countries. Um, and the third area of work that we carry out is knowledge exchange and collaboration. So again, linking leaders in the field um, in the financial sector, as well as with nonprofits and, and the public sector to increase collaboration and learning across actors to really advance uh, restoration efforts. And we, so we feel strongly about working with both the private and the public sectors. Um, and so our work is focused, our two strategies are in, in those uh, areas. And so the first with the private sector, we're looking to boost investment and restoration. And we do this by um, working with impact investors. So we created a coalition of impact investors that are actively deploying $2.5 billion of private investment in restoration initiatives. Um, we also work with restoration uh, entrepreneurs. So we have a land accelerator through which we support um, the development of business models and strengthen financial plans for restoration initiatives on the ground. And we have a network of 120 technical advisors. So a critical part of the work we do there is to bring all of them together so that the, um, the entrepreneurs can obtain uh, financing from the impact investors and the technical advisors are able to play an important role by working with the multiple actors as well. Um, and on the side of policy, we work actively to improve and create effective public policies by working with each of the member countries of Initiative 20 by 20. Um, and so over the years, we've established a close relationship with different ministries, not only with ministries of the environment, but also agriculture, water, um, and increasingly with the finance ministries, which really uh, at the end of the day are the decision makers and that will make some of these projects possible, right? Um, and so we, our work with the public sector involves uh, analytical and technical support. And so we focus on really a wide spectrum. So from the development and strengthening of national restoration strategies to also um, strengthening and developing new policies and regulations, as well as technical support for implementation and monitoring and evaluation. And on that last front, we recently created a policy accelerator 
Um, so this is a, a new project that initiated last year. This year, we're in the process of wrapping up the second cohort. And the policy accelerator is, well, it's a restoration policy accelerator. And it's a collaborative network and capacity building program that helps government leaders solve key challenges related specifically to policies around economic incentives for scaling restoration. So um, this year we're working with government leaders from Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico. And we do this through two main components. And so one is bilateral support where we work hand in hand with each of these countries to identify bottlenecks and create a short-term kind of roadmap of ways in which we can support them to develop solutions. And the second component of the accelerator is knowledge sharing and co-creation. So we deliver a series of modules on key topics with experts from around the world. Um, and these topics include things like design and implementation of incentives, monitoring and evaluation, low carbon agriculture, amongst others. And the sessions have this key talk component, but they're also meant to create a space for South-South collaboration, which has been really critical. Um, and so during these sessions, the participants, this year it's a cohort of 52 policymakers from these countries, they're able to uh, share progress on some of the problems that they're tackling and obtain fresh ideas and feedback from mentors and from peers. So it's been um, a really valuable space for, for these policymakers. And ultimately the program aims to build networks of mutual support and promote smart policies um, so that the accelerator can help governments to boost restoration implementation on the ground and contribute to global landscape restoration efforts more generally. Um, so this was, in a nutshell, a, a lot to share in a short period of time, but this is uh, essentially the work that we're carrying out in, in Latin America. Thank you, Maggie. We already have a question for you um, about, could you put some more information about this um, on the policy accelerator? Um, and, you know, is there a website that people can go to or how can they get more information about this? So if you could post something, um, I think either in the chat or as one of the um, questions that would be helpful. I also want to note, yeah, thank you. I also want to note that um, we have a couple already of, of uh, participants who are interested in sharing their stories. Um, we have one, if I can find it, I think it's from um, India. Uh, yes. Um, uh, it's from Ramesh, whose last name I can't see. I'm sorry, Ramesh, I can't see it in the chat, but who said he had a chance to develop a landscape-based climate change adaptation mitigation pilot project in the state of Madhya Pradesh in India. It's pending Ministry of Environmental Approval. It's taking a long time, um, but he has that story. And then let me find the other one um, we just had. Um, where that Jerry Hirsch mentions perhaps of interest as a project that um, his organization did with UNDP and 10 African nations called Climate Action Intelligence. That was a method of showing linkages across the key ministries and stakeholders to show their complex links and the foundations for writing a national action plan. So um, we really have some really great, um, uh, some great uh, examples online here. Let me just make sure I'm, and then um, we do have a, a question from uh, one of my favorite former employees, Adam Schenkman um, from USDA, who's asking you specifically, Maggie, do you have an example of restoration entrepreneurship that you could share. So maybe you could answer that one while I look for more questions um, because yeah, over to you, Maggie. Sure, thank you, Jocelyn. And um, happy to share more resources in the chat. And then also I should mention, you know, I work directly with Initiative 20 by 20, but we also collaborate closely with our WRI India office. Um, and we also have offices in Africa and so we, and we are looking to expand the accelerator work to other regions. Um, so, so you can kind of uh, follow our progress on our, on our website. Um, and in terms of entrepreneurships, there are 60 different or more than 60 projects that are, that are listed on our website and I'd be happy to share um, just off the top. I mean, there, there are so many 
different types, mainly in agroforestry. I think ones that are very interesting in, in Latin America are cacao and the coffee projects that, um, that are really well integrated with reforestation efforts. Um, I am struggling to find an immediate one. I've really been so immersed in the policy accelerator recently that the entrepreneurship side of the work that we do is in, is not as fresh in my mind, but happy to share more in the in the chat. Yes, and that's generating some lot, a lot of good um, information. And um, I also want to do a little shout out to Chris Obi, who has a conservation project in his community in Nigeria. So there's definitely lots of things popping up around. I think the cohesion um, amongst them and linking these maybe smaller projects um, to the larger um, to the larger policies, to the national policies, um, even in some cases with countries such as, you know, large ones such as India, the United States, Canada, you know, linking them to regional initiatives is, is so important. Um, Maggie, we have one more question for you before I go back to everybody else. We do have a little time for questions, everyone, but um, there is a question from Paul Demerit who's asking, how do you incentivize the uptake of conservation agriculture practices among small scale farmers uh, when adopting those practices may have upfront costs that um, might be too, too hard for them to overcome? I'm kind of um, synthesizing and summarizing here. And Luke, you might want to answer that as well, but sort of, you know, how do you um, get farmers to buy in when, you know, they, they're, these are not, um, these are not people who have lots of collateral, lots of financial opportunities, lots of, they're not people with, um, you know, huge amounts of investments in their banks. So right. yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. And I think that's where um, incentive programs are critical. And so payment for ecosystem services programs have been quite effective um, in Costa Rica. They're, they're, you know, implemented broadly. The program has existed for the last 20 years. And it does work with farmers. And in, in Mexico, um, we're actually working with the forestry agency at the moment to find a way to adapt um, the, the payment for ecosystem services policies to work with irrigation districts. And what we find is that in order to really engage with the agricultural sector, it's important to find those levers like where, uh, where you see that there's really a need on their end as well. And so in, in northern states of Mexico, where water scarcity is a critical challenge, it's much easier to engage with the agricultural sector because it's becoming clear to them that if they don't restore um, the upper parts of the watershed, and that if they don't integrate different types of sustainable um, irrigation practices and reduce water consumption, then really their business is, is at risk, right? Um, and so there's been more receptiveness um, in those regions of Mexico and in other countries where there's a clear um, need to invest in nature-based solutions and where it's clear that it's a win-win solution and that it's uh, not, um, not, not, not just something that, uh, that will be a cost to them. But surely there aren't extra, you know, it's, it's, it's not that they have a surplus of resources so that's where it really is the government responsibility to provide incentives that can compensate and make sure that the burden is not uh, entirely placed on the farmers. Luke, you look like you wanted to say something and Maggie, you, I mean, Sarah, you look like you also want to say something. So I'll, Go I'll first you with talk. Luke. Go first Go with, with Luke. Luke. Okay. And I'm Luke. sure Ernest has a lot to say about this. Yeah. That... <laughs> Luke? Yes. Uh, yes. Farmers, they need evidence that what you, you want them to transition to work. So what we often do is to have a, you know, an agent of change, a farmer who has taken the lead in making that transition. For instance, in moving from one crop that was not suitable anymore to a crop that is much more drought tolerant or something like that, where they need to also see that there is an access to market for it. And to have that farmer coming with us to speak to other farmers, because farmers do trust farmers. So the, one of the way to get the buying of farmers is to look for someone who has who has actually already taken the lead with this, with this step and work with him. That one at least has worked so far for us. Okay. 
I think I would add there that, you know, farming is risky business, right? It is so Indeed. dependent on elements that are outside of human control that, um, you know, they, they tend to be, far, and this is true worldwide in my, in my view, um, that they tend to be a conservative lot because they're already dealing with so much risk anyway. You know, rainfall, weather patterns, drought, you know, soil changes, um, so, you know, I think really demonstrating to them, you know, they've got a really, they're, they're hard sells in a way because they're already dealing with so much risk. Um, Sarah, you had a comment. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's been very interesting in looking at the trajectory of the development of landscape partnerships around the world over the last 20, 30 years is that the agricultural sector and farmer groups were one of, in some places, a, a little later to the game. Um, a lot of the, you know, it was really, a lot of the stuff started with forestry, with biodiversity, with things where you could really clearly see that the landscape wide, you know, act, uh, framing was critical. And I think one of the big changes, and for me, very exciting changes in the last five years has been the embrace by many within the agricultural community, including farmers organizations of seeing that there are real benefits. If you narrowly define what can we do to support farmers as something that has to happen just within in supply chains and just within um, you know ministries of agriculture you really narrow the range of groups that have a vested interest in farmers doing things well so you you start to bring in these relationships with cities and getting consumer groups and and, and restaurant groups by contributing to a landscape action plan that actually has direct benefits for farmers similarly with things like the disaster mitigation work that actually it hugely affects farmers if that if you know the problem in a lot of places now is they used to flood once every five years and now they're flooding once every two or three years uh, so they need the disaster mitigation people to get to be supporting them so if you have a framing around a landscape partnership all these other actors can be you know, discussed with and negotiated with about how they can modify slightly the work they're doing to give benefits for what they're looking for and have direct benefits for smallholder farmers. And I think it, it really changes the game. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm good I'm idea. Excited. Fair enough. And just, yeah, if I could add that uh, many of the um, restoration activities uh, and investments in soil health and um, can have long-term economic um, benefits for, uh, for farmers. But as we've uh, acknowledged, it's hard to, those benefits may not materialize for five years or 10 years. Um, but so we need to come up with mechanisms that can uh, uh, advance payments to landowners, uh, to farmers um, in year one, um, even though, uh, and sort of uh, amortize those benefits or accelerate them. Um, so that the landowners begin to see the, the payback right away. And there is a real role for um, potential uh, private investment in this um, arena, using private financing to create those uh, ecosystem services payments, as it were, and, um, and spread out. Uh, and then with the investors getting repaid, uh, maybe in year five or 10, when the, the uh, economic benefits on the ground begin to flow. So um, I think about uh, accelerate about um, regenerative agriculture grazing practices that um, uh, are improving uh, soil carbon retention and uh, 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 regeneration of native prairies in uh, the Southwest. And um, the, the carbon benefits are not going to be measurable for five or 10 years and, and then be marketable on the carbon markets. Um, but we know that those are going to take place. So there are programs uh, emerging where um, ranchers get paid for regenerative grazing practices in year one um, as they are incurring the cost of those. So those are important uh, opportunities, I think. It's a, a way of costing things and looking at things differently. And frankly, you know, if we can do it on Wall Street, because Wall Street has figured out a million different ways of making money on a million different things, why can't we figure this out in this space, right? Yeah. Um, right? So, um, so I, Sarah, I wanted to, um, I'm not going to direct this comment to you because I'm kind of going to do our lightning round, um, but there is a, a question for you about co-governance in the Q&A, so I just wanted to alert you to that. 
Um, and thank you all. Uh, before we um, do to our lightning round, I also want to thank uh, a number of our participants in the audience have have uh, given us a lot of compliments on our um, on our presentation and our uh, webinar so far. So I want to thank our audience for being such active participants. Um, as we come to our last 10 minutes or five to 10 minutes of this conversation, I just wanted to um, ask each one of you, um, one of, you can answer one of two questions. Um, one of them is a little bit easier is, you know, what's your key takeaway that you'd like the, the audience and the public um, to hear? And the second one is, um, you could also answer it in um, what, what would you like to disabuse the public of in terms of this area? Is there a myth that you would like to debunk um, for the public to hear? So one's question's easy, one's hard, you get to pick. Um, Sarah, I'll let you go first. Uh, sure. Um, I think that when we're, we're thinking about landscape partnerships, um, there's this sense of them being this low level, local, really diverse, you can't control it from the outside process, often informal relationships. And I think it, that there's just a myth among policymakers at both the national and the state level that they're not real entities to engage with as partners. When in fact, in the places where they're well-developed, they actually are excellent partners for government actors. They, they provide a platform for many stakeholders to come together over a long time through as the political winds change over time, as governors and uh, ministers and district officers change over time. These partners, the, these collaboratives can sustain over time. They have a long-term vision. They're really logical partners, but that means that the policymakers need to modify the way they're engaging and their processes for engaging with these collaboratives and empower them to do so, put that in law, make it easy for government actors to collaborate with them because sometimes they're not even allowed to uh, because there's a different process in place. And at the same time, um, I think we need to be supporting landscape partnerships to build the skills and capacities to do a good job in de de devising their action plans, defining their investments in such a way that it's easy for government counterparts to collaborate with them and they understand what's going on. So I think there's work to be done on both sides. Uh, there's also a myth among landscape partnerships that based on experience from 20 years ago, that they're not going to be able to get significant help from governments. And in fact, that's just no longer true in most countries. There's resources, there's, there's actors that care about their issues, and the whole relationship has changed dramatically in the 20 years that I've been working with landscape partnerships. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Having worked myself in the government and also worked with governments in my role in the FAO, I completely agree with you. Um, there are many, many players out there in all kinds of ministries and departments that are, you know, that it's that are interested in advancing these stages. And it's a question, you know, unfortunately, it's a it's a bit of a hunt. It's a bit of a you know treasure hunt to find out where they are. But um, in an event, I agree completely with you. Um, I'll turn to Luke next. Uh, Luke, do you have a key takeaway or a myth that you'd like to bust? Yes, let me start with a myth. The myth is that uh, ministers of finance can't understand landscape. And because we believe that we don't reach out to them using the, you know, the language they speak. And that is something that you must learn to do. Uh, if I speak my mother tongue, you can't get what I mean. So we need to really bring landscape issues, challenges, and result and potential uh, uh, outcome or positive outcome into languages that they can understand. I have experienced that on, on and on. It is important to take them in kind of bilateral and speak to them using their languages and you, you can get them on board. That is a myth that we can easily break if we take time you know, and speak the language for it. The, the, the second point that is uh, uh, challenging for us in Benin is at the uh, local level, bring people to understand the concept of landscape. Uh, and the solution we have found is to bring them uh, around the issue they are confronting, uh, especially the issue of degradation. And when you bring them together around those issues, then they can understand how they are connected 
how the partnership makes sense and how they could build a, a vision around to know the way forward. Over to you, Jocelyn. Merci, Luke. Thank you so much. And you know, we can learn about landscapes and ministers of finance are smart people and they can figure it out, right? So we should give them the tools and the knowledge they need to understand it rather than assuming they can't understand it, right? So um, and I'm making a joke, but I, I, there's truth behind my joke. Ernest, what, is there a key takeaway or a myth that you'd like to bust? Um, well, I thought Sarah's comments were just right on. It's really interesting that she is speaking from a global perspective, um, countries all over the world. Um, and I was just struck by how many of her comments are uh, uh, apt for the situation in the United States as well. Um, I guess one um, myth that I'd like to uh, try to bust is that landscape conservation is somehow only about land that's way out yonder, that it doesn't really involve, you know, the people who live in urban areas. Um, and, you know, I mentioned the New Jersey Highlands Coalition protecting the water sources for over 300 municipalities. That's over almost 5 million people um, living in cities or, get, or so urban areas and get their water from the highlands. So there are really important connections um, between our cities and uh, our landscapes um, and the farmers that are producing food, well, that is feeding people uh, who live in urban areas. Um, so it, it would just be, I think, really behoove everyone working in this sector to do more to try to connect um, the, the, the urban communities with the, the landscapes that surround them. Thank you so much, Ernest. I come from the great city of Cleveland, Ohio, which uh, when I was growing up was a lot of urban blight, um, a lot of concrete parking lots, um, you know, just really hit hard by, and of course the Cuyahoga River was on fire and, you know, the changes that have happened, now there's urban gardens um, and there's, um, you know, the river has been cleaned up. It can happen. And I completely agree with you. The landscapes is here right with us, not out yonder. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more. And thank you for raising that. Maggie, last but definitely not least, uh, if you could give, either give us a takeaway or a, a bust a myth, what would that be? Thanks, Jocelyn. Um... I think mine would be that while it's true that there isn't a silver bullet solution, um, I just find it fascinating to listen to the different experiences from the US. I, mean, I worked in Washington state for a while with farmers on water rights issues, and then now in Latin America and hearing Luke, um, there isn't a silver bullet solution, but at the end of the day, uh, we're all more similar than we are different. And there's so much to learn from incentives uh, that are and policies that are already working effectively in different countries. Um, and so I guess my Mythbusters is that, that we're, we're more similar than we are different. And these spaces are incredibly valuable because we, in, in many cases, don't need to recreate the wheel. We just need to have more conversations um, and, and collaboration to learn from what's already working. Um, so could not agree more. Right. And, and, you know, there's lots of problems out there. We can be focused on our problems, but frankly, the solutions are not that difficult and yeah. it takes some intentionality, um, some bringing together of the right coalitions that Sarah talked about, you know, it's not this kind of woohoo kind of people out there. It's actual, you know, government employees, private sector, public sector, and, and it can be done. So, with that, with your permission, Sarah, I'm gonna close our very um, fruitful, engaging, lively topic. Is there any last words that you'd like to say, Sarah? Oh, there... it was great to see the group and the really active participation of people in the chat and providing and sharing those resources. Uh, we will be following up from this event uh, with some materials, just give us a, a week or two. Um, we'll share with you the, um, the recording of the event. We'll share, we're going to edit the, the, just for readability, the chat and the Q&A. Uh, we'll be producing a little report that summarizes some of the key messages that came out. And so we'll be circulating all of that to you um, relatively soon. Um, and my only last thing would be to, to, to say thank you so much, of course, to FAO. 
So thanks so much for hosting and for co-organizing this, um, this, this series of, of events with us. Uh, stay tuned, there, there's more coming. Uh, and also thanks all the folks behind the scene at FAO and Eco Agriculture Partners who, uh, who really helped us uh, make this happen. And I guess I'll let, leave it to you to thank our wonderful panelists, uh, yes. uh, other ones who came on. So Yes, many thanks to our panelists and, and also to your team, um, Juan Ramos and my team, Ali, Richter and um, uh, James Cordero who actually, and Adi Mohammed who actually were behind the scenes making this all look pretty seamless. So um, anyway, have a great day to everyone and let's keep going with these conversations. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Jocelyn. Take care. <laughs>